It is great to be here one more time today, and my name is Gary Fowler, and I am the host of How to Build a Unicorn. I'm a 17-time serial entrepreneur with several significant startups under the belt. I was on the original management team of Click Software, which was sold to Salesforce, and also EVA.ai, an AI at your tech company. We believe that intellectual capacity is evenly spread around the world, for the opportunities are not. So with that, I have an incredible guest, a good friend, uh, uh, an amazing, amazing uh, venture builder, uh, venture capitalist. So Bill Reichert, Bill has uh, uh, got his undergraduate degree at Harvard University, graduate degree at Stanford, has been a venture capitalist for a long time. Currently, he is a partner in Pegasus, a $2 billion fund. He had been a partner with Guy Kawasaki and Garage Technology Ventures. He's not only an investor, he is also um, speaks around the world about um, technology and building companies. Uh, and today we're going to talk about his book is Getting to Wow. And I know we talk about getting to wow. So with that, I'd like to introduce Bill Riker. Hey, Bill, how are you today? I'm doing great, Gary. Thank you so much for having me. And and thanks, thank you to all of you for, for joining us today. I appreciate the opportunity to, to chat with you. So tell us a little bit about it. So, you know, when you when you started writing your book, what made you decide? You know, you talk about wow, but what is wow? So, well, okay, I'll, uh, um, I will tell you the sort of a little bit of the of the background of the whole thing. You know, long long ago and far away, um, I, I was uh, asked to join a as a judge do a pitch competition, and uh, by someone who I had done this before. And I love working with entrepreneurs. And for whatever reason, she kind of caught me off guard. And so she, she, you know, she was talking, we were talking and she was inviting me to be a judge at this pitch competition. And she heard me moan. I, I sort of went, uh, and, um, and she said, Bill, what do you mean? I thought you just loved, you know, entrepreneurs and working with entrepreneurs they said, yeah, but, you know, I tell you, these pitches are just so bad. I'm just, it's so exhausting mm -hmm. listening to these entrepreneurs. And, you know, it's impossible to figure out what the hell they're talking about and why anybody should invest in them. And she went, what? What? I mean, there's there's all of these, you know, pitch coaches out there and teaching entrepreneurs how to do great pitches and, you know, all this all this sort of instruction now that the ecosystem has evolved. <clears throat> and I said, yeah, but you know, they're just they're just really terrible. And so she said, well, okay, why don't you see if you can fix that? <laughs> and so I I started paying more attention to what the pitch coaches were saying, to what I had learned over many years as an entrepreneur. You know, as an, you know, you, one of the things that, that Gary did not mention is I actually started my career here in Silicon Valley when I was a grad student at Stanford long ago. Um, I started my first software company and uh, and so I uh, that's got me hooked in into Silicon Valley. Uh, wound up doing the serial entrepreneur bit. Uh, started or co-founded or restarted four different companies, and uh, two of which went public, two of which crashed and burned. Right. <laughs> and so, um, but you know, not terrible, not terrible batting average. But um, but uh, you know, during the course of being an entrepreneur. I had to pit, I figured I had to do about 250 pitches across those companies. And across the four companies, I raised about a hundred million dollars, which back then was a lot of money. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, so I learned a thing or two about pitching, and I was extremely lucky in terms of, you know, the some of the firms that um wound up investing in me, but I had you know, John Doerr from Kleiner Perkins, he was on my board and Excel Partners, they invested in me and Intel Capital invested in my company and Microsoft invested in one of my companies. I mean, I had some I had some really, really great um, investors that we managed to get over the years. 
Um, so, uh, so I thought I knew a thing or two about pitching, right? And then I crossed over and I became a VC. And I noticed, you know, there was this proliferation of these demo days and pitch competitions and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, giving back and participating. And it was, you know, and it fun for me to uh, to be a judge in these pitching competitions. And and so I realized that that whatever everybody was being taught was just messing them up. So, you know, I said to my friend, you know, as 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 an industry, you know, as a community, somehow the venture ecosystem is actually doing damage to these poor entrepreneurs in the way that they're teaching them to pitch. Um, and that's when she said, okay, look, you know, tell us, uh, see if you can fix it. And so I was um, talking to a bunch of my other VC buddies. Um, and to give credit where, where credit is due, um, I uh, the whole idea of wow came from a friend of mine, John Hall, who was a um, a partner at Horizon Ventures. And and John told me the story of when he took his company public. And so when he was doing the roadshow to go public on NASDAQ, uh, he, being a typical Silicon Valley engineer entrepreneur, had this you know, dense pitch for his roadshow for the IPO. So this is, you know, Broadway, right? I mean, so if if Silicon Valley is off Broadway, right? IPO is Broadway. And um, and he thought, it, you know, he, he thought he was a pretty good, you know, at pitching, uh, given how successful his company had been. And so he got slammed by this um, advisor coach who was who had spent his career teaching CEOs how to pitch on um, uh, you know on Wall Street, uh, and and he said, yeah, you know, Jerry said, uh, you know, John, John, John. Okay, I get it. I get your tech stack, and I get your, you know, your 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 software protocols, and I get your, you know, architecture diagram. But God damn, tell me. What is your wow? And and that was where that's where it came from. John telling me about this coach saying the key to doing a good pitch is not to cover off all of these topics and explain everything about your product and technology and the market and go to market and financials and all that stuff. It's not about explaining. It's about getting to wow, figuring out how you're going to get the listeners to say, oh my gosh, that's amazing. You can do that. You've done that. You can, you've can. you accomplished that. Tell me more. And, and so that was sort of the, the genesis of the, of the term getting to wow. And uh, so then I took it on the road. Um, you know, I was just, I just did it as a workshop for our portfolio companies. And then, you know, I got some other people to say, hey, Bill, can you tell our portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. And then several years later, a friend of mine, Angelica, uh, Angelica Blenstrip, uh, who is a advisor coach to mainly international entrepreneurs. Angelica speaks five languages and she, um, she has uh, quite a reputation coaching international entrepreneurs on how to be successful here in Silicon Valley or here in the United States. So Angelica came to me and she said, hey, Bill, um, why don't you pull together this workshop you do into a book? And I said, ah, you know, I don't I, I just, I, I'd love to do it, but I don't have time to do it. And she said, well, do you mind if I do it for you? And so, you know, she pulled together some of my slides um, and came back to me and she said, okay, you know, would you edit this? <laughs> So it was just the classic, classic, I'm going to use a, a metaphor here that may or may not work, but it's the classic Tom Sawyer story. I don't know if you know, how many people know the Tom Sawyer story? The Tom Sawyer story is, you know, Tom Sawyer is told by his aunt, you know, you got to paint the fence today. Um, and so he goes out in front of the house and pretends to start painting the fence. His friends come by 
and his friends. And he says to his friends, boy, I, you know, this is the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life is painting this fence. And his friends all say, oh, oh, can I, can I, can I paint the fence instead? So Angelica comes to me and says, I'm, you know, I'm having so much fun writing this book for you. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so, you know, the 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 bottom line was that no, 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 that's okay. I'll I'll write the book. I'll write the book. I'll write the book. So so Angelico is the you know is, Angelica is the co-author. She you know she's the spirit. Um, but uh, so that's how it all came together. That was perhaps more more history, more story than you wanted. But um, so basically, I you know I had the opportunity during COVID um, to convert all of these slides and all of these stories and all of these lessons learned into the book, uh, Getting to Wow, Silicon Valley Pitch Secrets for Entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, and then I, I had, um, I went over it with a bunch of friends uh, and Gary, you contributed as well. Um, and uh, who, you know, helped me refine it, et cetera. Um, you know, Guy, Guy, Guy Kawasaki offered, uh, who is my partner at, at Garage Technology Ventures, um, you know, he was great. And he, you know, he went through it with a fine tooth comb um, as sort of, you know, payback. I had gone through his, you know, his, his, uh, his seminal book, The Art of the Start. Um, I had gone through that with a fine tooth comb. And so he, he, um, he, he quid pro quoed me there. So that was great. Um and um, and so that's how that's how the whole thing came together. But and I can go into more kind of the elements of it um, if you want. But in yeah, terms no, of that would be great. But I mean, what are, what are, so what do you you know, to get the wow, is it about the person? Is it about the technology? Is it about the magic? What What is it? Is it are all of the above? What 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 constitutes like, wow. So when you're at Pegasus and, you know, somebody comes in and really get you with a presentation. What is it that that grabs your grabs you about it? Right, right, right. Well, the right the important thing to know is that there's not necessarily one particular element of each company, um, or there's not there's not a standard answer to that question. The important thing to know is that each company may have a different wow. And so, but but what what most entrepreneurs, you know, don't appreciate because because they're coached to jam as much stuff as they can possibly jam into however much time they've got. And so they're just focused on sort of getting all this stuff across in whatever time they've got. They they don't pay attention to the single most critical factor that is at the core of wow. And the single most critical factor at the core of wow is um, that you know, my epiphany, when I crossed over into being a VC and I started studying this, my epiphany was that investors do not invest with their brains. Mm -hmm. And that's like shocking to everybody. What, you know, they're paid a lot of money, they're smart, right? investors do not invest with their brains investors invest with their hearts and if you want to get the attention of an investor it's not good enough to explain everything you've got to get them to fall in love you've got to get them to fall in love after all wow is not an intellectual response think about it right wow is not an intellectual response wow is an emotional response and that's what I mean by getting them to fall in love. And so your question, Gary, is why do VCs fall in love, right? So somebody was going to write a song on that. <laughs> that's, that, sounds, that, sounds, right? that sounds like the, uh, the name of a song. <laughs> why do VCs fall in love? <laughs> Where's Chad GPT? So, we need it. <laughs> so, right. So why do, why do, you know, why do VCs fall in love? And they fall love for a variety of different reasons and uh, you know so if you go to a typical vc conference and uh, you know you ask vcs you know what's the most important thing you look at probably you know probably most vcs will say it's the team yeah you know we back teams right that's what we back we back teams 
Um, but, uh, you know, and that's sometimes, that's sometimes why VCs fall in love, right? Um, and so, so sometimes we fall in love with a team and they've got, you know, some smart people who are really smart about their domain. domain. They're very accurate. They're obviously working well together. And it looks like they're, you know, achieving a lot together, a lot of energy, a lot of positive um, uh, uh, energy in the room. And, and so sometimes we fall in love with the team. Uh, and we'll say, oh, my gosh, you know, I think this, this team can really pull this off. Uh, and that's, but sometimes, you know, sometimes we'll get the geekiest, nerdiest, uh, pocket protector kind of, you know, engineer scientists who come, you know, come into our conference room and, um, but they can make bits do things that bits have never done before, <laughs> or, you know, or they can make atoms do things that atoms have never, I mean, but they have, you know, they have something extraordinary in terms of their technology. And, you know, we investors, we know you should, you're not supposed to fall in love with technology, right? Um, so that's, by the way, a, you know, a, a, a meme in the VC community, don't fall in love with technology. But, so, you know, but it, we all have this background. I mean, part of the reason we're here in the venture ecosystem is because we fall in love with technology, right? Um, so it's it's sort of this, you know, Silicon Valley uh, sort of underlying ethos. But so, but sometimes we fall in love with technology and then we rationalize around all the other elements. Um, sometimes, sometimes we fall in love with the vision. You know, sometimes the team, they come into our office and they paint a vision of how they are going to make a dent in the universe. And they make the argument convincingly that we actually believe they can do it. Mm -hmm. And that's the hard part, right? Every entrepreneur thinks, thinks that they're going to make a dent in the universe. You know, we're going to disrupt the $3.5 trillion healthcare market. You know, nobody believes you when you say that. Nobody believes you, okay? <laughs> but every once in a while, you get this, you know, well-articulated, well-pointed um, um, pitch about, you know, sort of taking advantage of this opportunity to make a dent in the universe. And you go, wow, that is so cool. I want to be part of that. Um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll so I'll tell, I'm going to tell you this. Can I tell the story of my favorite dent in the universe? Yeah, pitch? sure. Go ahead. Absolutely. Okay. My favorite dent in the universe pitch. Um, and I'll tell you, I mean, I've, so a side story here, we are investors in SpaceX. So you would think that SpaceX would be my favorite dent in the universe pitch and, you know, almost literally a dent in the universe, right? Um, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you. <laughs> SpaceX. I, love, I, got, I, got, I love that. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, it's, you know, SpaceX is absolutely, you know, sort of one of my top five. Um, but my favorite dent in the universe pitch is the team, um, you know, four entrepreneurs from Stanford, two engineers and two MBAs who went through a program at Stanford at what is called the D school or the design school. They went through, through this course called Designing for Extreme Affordability. And the big idea of the course is to use engineering and other talent and skills to create things that can change the lives of billions of people who are not in the developed world. So that's the big idea behind the course. The big, the big idea behind the D school, the design school, is to bring together the disciplines of engineering and design and business um, to create um, fast-growing, sustainable companies. But so four, four students come over and they, they give us this pitch on how they have developed a solar rechargeable lantern that is cheaper and better than kerosene for to provide light lighting for the 2 billion people on the planet 
who do not have access to reliable grid electricity. And so we hear this pitch and, you know, this, these stories about, uh, you know, the, 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 the problem, obviously, of kerosene lanterns that, you know, get, give asthma to children, burn down houses, carbon footprint, you know, government subsidy, just, you know, kerosene's a mess, right? And, um, and they have taken, you know, the sort of Silicon Valley engineering skills to create this solar rechargeable lantern that is cheaper and better than kerosene. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, they have they, their prototype that they built in the course. And we sort of, you know, we got, you know what, this is really touching. This is really moving. And we say, well, yeah, but this is kind of one of those do good social impact companies, right? You know, and, you know, God bless you, but we're, you know, we're VCs, right? We're, we're all about, you know, building unicorns, right? And they came over the table at us and said, you don't get it. If we're going to change the lives of 2 billion people, we've got to build a big, scalable, multinational, profitable, fast-growing, high-impact corporation. We go, whoa, we, we love these guys. We love these guys. <laughs> So this was a company called Delight Design, Delight Design, and um, and we were the first investors in Delight Design. Um, Draper uh, Draper came in as well, and then they got a series of other investors. Uh, and uh, one of the very, very, very few startup companies we ever funded that actually hit their time and numbers. In you know the ones that they originally pitched to us, they actually hit them in terms of 1.4 million in revenues in the first 14 months, and it was like you know this is a you know Valhalla kind of experience to have a startup company doing something that's going to make a dent in the universe that actually delivers and hits their numbers. So they went on to you know extraordinary success, and to this day they are now the leading. They're their leading solar rechargeable lighting solution in all of the markets that they are in. Needless to say, there are a number of other people that started to chase them, um, but they have continued. They, you know, they continued to engineer advanced solutions and, you know, added a whole bunch of other things over time. Changed the name of the company to Delight, and on their website, what you'll see is number of lives impacted. And I'm not sure where they are now, but. You know, many years, several years ago, they crossed 100 million lives. Um, and so that, you know, the fact that at the time it was a wow, it was a, you know, a, a wow vision and they actually delivered is, um, you know, makes them, makes them, you know, my favorite wow story. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. So, you know, you've been doing this a long time. You've, and, <laughs> You've seen a lot of companies, you know, you you said you invested in SpaceX and many, many well-known companies. Do you mm -hmm. feel something special? I mean, when you're inside of those companies and you just, is there an R around it? You know, so we just had one example, but when, for instance, with SpaceX, I mean, people are talking about it all the time. I mean, it's, I hear it a lot every day. Yeah. And I don't know what it's wow or uh, admiration, but you know, it's, it's enchanting, right? It's like, you, you, you know, doing something that other people have not been able to do. So do you feel like that? I know you said you went into SpaceX's uh, facilities. Was it, did you have a, like a, that, just a feeling that this is like um, energy in there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no question. Um, SpaceX, SpaceX is, you know, my favorite you know, due diligence site visit, visit, right? So as a VC, you know, when you're going to invest in a company, you want to go to their facility and, you know, check it out, right? Um, see what's going on. You know, the uh, the SpaceX facility down in Hawthorne um, is absolutely positively mind-boggling. I mean, I, you know, as a Silicon Valley investor over the years, I've been to you know, a number of fabs, right? You know, you go into a fab and the bunny suits and the whole thing, and it's, um, you know, which is pretty cool, pretty cool, pretty fascinating. But, but you know, for the most part, the, the end product that you see 
are you know these these beautiful silver wafers, right? Um, and um, and you know it's kind of they're pretty and it's cool and you get you know you get they go inside computers and they do amazing things. You go to SpaceX, you go to SpaceX, you know, and they're building rockets, right? <laughs> they're building and they're launching rockets, and you know, and there's just something there's just something viscerally cool about that watching watching them build you know you've got all of these people that are crawling all over these you know platforms and they're wiring and they're screwing and they're bolting and they're um you know against these engines and we saw the um the dragon capsule that you know put the that that they send up to the um uh they send up to the space station we saw the first one that was being built um and you know it's without the you know without without the um the shell and you see it's you know unbelievable amount of wiring um but just unbelievably complex to see and they're in this you know they're in a um uh, uh a uh, a a clean room you know, putting this this massive capsule together, um, and then and then you just see, and then you see the rocket itself. You know these massive tubes um, that they're building and the fairings that go out. I mean, it just it's and then so it happened. Our first site visit at the end of our discussion. You know, then we go into conference and all that stuff, but um, all the boring stuff. Um, but then we're done the meeting and, and, um, our host looks at his watch and he says, oh, oh, I think we've got something going on right now. And he takes us out and we stand there in front of mission control and watch them launch, you know, from Cape, from Cape Canaveral, but they've got a mission control room, you know, right out of the movies, right. <laughs> With these, <laughs> you know, yeah. massive two story screens and you know 35 people at their consoles um sort of each having different components that they're they're monitoring and you watch the rocket take off and and you know the whole the whole uh facility is crowded around watching you know so we're watching with everyone else um you know and a security a security guy comes up to me and taps me on the shoulder and says what the you know what are you doing here because <laughs> I'm not an employee um you know and my host you know, it points to my badge and vouches for me that I'm legal, <laughs> but um, and then you see, but the you know the the added coolness factor for everybody who knows you know SpaceX, the coolness factor is that they recover the um, they recover the the stage one. Um, it has its own engines and its own. It has you know uh, expandable legs, and it lands out on the Atlantic Ocean. You know, it comes back, it lands on the Atlantic Ocean on what looks like a postage stamp. <laughs> I mean, it's it's unbelievable. Um, you know, that this rocket comes back down, lands on a postage stamp, and then they recover it so that they can reuse it. Um, and so, and that's the big, you know, and that's the big secret to SpaceX. If you can reuse a rocket that would dramatically, dramatically, dramatically cuts the cost per launch. Because um, traditionally, um, everybody else in the world would burn the entire system uh, and throw it away. And so that's the brilliance of SpaceX is being able to reuse these rockets. And so they now have some of the rockets that have, um, some of the rockets that have been reused over 10 times now. So. Uh, it's a it's an extraordinary extraordinary experience, right? Um, you know, it's a different kind of wow, obviously, than you know, than saving the lives of two billion people on the planet. So, so right, obviously, I am an incredibly incredibly lucky guy <laughs> that I get to. I mean, you've done you know. you've done amazing things, Bill. And, well, you know, for the, we have startups. We have a, about a hundred startups. Yeah. Uh, individuals online uh, today from all over the world, from Africa, from Europe, from all over the place. But, yeah. you know, with the, the market the way it is, what's the best way for them to get attention of a VC so that they get a chance to talk about their wow? What's the best way to do it? How do you get, I know we've talked about this before, but yeah. Just yeah. with this, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do, what's the best way to do it? 
Well, okay. So, you know, venture capital is is sort of at a certain level in the whole entrepreneur startup company journey. It's not at the beginning. It's not at the beginning level of the startup journey. You know, the beginning level is generally, you know, some combination or variation on you know, friends and family slash bootstrapping, creating something that you can validate and or some angel funding with some credible angels or angel groups that give you some validation or signal of, of success or a quality accelerator program um, and, you know, a little bit of financing from that, that, you know, signals that you're legit. So, so the first thing is, in terms of venture capital, the first thing is you've got to build, you know, some level of, of you know, bona fides. You've got to build, establish some credibility that, that you, you know, can indeed execute at some level and deliver something that is, is unique. And, you know, the core that, that, you know, we haven't talked about yet but the core of it is you've got to be able to, to, to convincingly demonstrate that you are or you will be delivering a compelling value proposition. And that's, that's what, to my surprise, I hardly ever hear pitch coaches talk about that. I hardly ever hear, you know, conferences make this point that, in my point of view, from my point of view, in all of my experience, the single most important aspect of getting an investor to fall in love, if you want to sort of isolate out, you know, why do VCs fall in love? The single most important thing is, do you deliver a compelling value proposition? Compelling meaning, you know, 10x better or, you know, one tenth the cost or last 10 times long, whatever. But it's got to be compelling because from an investor's point of view, if it ain't compelling, then it's going to be hard to sell. Mm -hmm. I mean, so does, if does it's a little compelling, does, Bill, a question for you. Every, yeah. When we're focused on revenue a lot. Mm -hmm. So does that build the compelling story and show the credibility when they come back and say, listen, I got $2.3 million worth of revenue. I'm going to grow to five this year. Is that a compelling story? Does it, does that catch your attention or is there more? Well, it is. It, it, so what I want to know underneath that, you know, if, if a, you know, early stage company has launched and ramped to $2.3 million in, you know, the last 12 months, Something good is going on. Something good is going on. Um, and so I, I'm the 2.3 million itself is not a wow for me, but it's a signal that they got something. And so the issue for us is not 2.3 million, it's 230 million, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so can, you know, is the something good that's going on, uh, you know, good enough? that this company can scale rapidly to 230 million. And so that's going to be the underlying compelling value proposition. So, you know, what, what do I mean by value proposition? To be crystal clear, a value proposition is a benefit, almost always quantifiable, but it's generally a quantifiable benefit that is realized by the customer of the company. Mm -hmm. So what is a benefit? You know, a benefit... You know, generally it's faster, better, cheaper, right? So, you know, I have a task or a need or a want that um, that is something I, as a customer, whether I may be a company, I might be the government, I might be a consumer, whatever, but I have something that needs to get done. Um, and can you do it, you know, can you do it in a way that is 10 times better than you know my alternatives, either the way I'm doing it today or the competition that's out there. So I, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, particularly engineers and scientists, um, have a tendency to think that their technology or their science is the compelling value proposition. And this mm -hmm. is why, you know, this is why we've learned over the years, don't fall in love with technology. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I 
I remember having I had this conversation with this with this entrepreneurial team that was developing some power electronics um, uh, circuitry chips, and um, and I said, okay, hey, I, you know, but tell me what is your compelling value proposition? And they looked at me and they said, well, we use silicon nitride. <laughs> no, silicon nitride is not a compelling value proposition. Now it turns out, you know, I I'm, again not a semiconductor scientist, um, but you know, there's some bent, there's some there's some features to silicon nitride that make it attractive for power electronics. I'm betting there are a bunch of people on this call who can appreciate that. <laughs> but you know, what is compelling? that I eventually got to that for whatever crazy reason, you know, was not clear from everything they told us mm -hmm. is that they reduced the inefficiency of power electronics by 50%. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, they, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and so consider all the power electronics out there on the planet. Um, and there's, a, you know, there's a lot of energy wasted on power electronics. Every electronic device you have, you know, it basically converts AC current to DC current uh, and wastes energy along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some other things that convert DC into AC and waste energy along the way. Uh, and so if you cut that waste by 50%, that is a dent in the universe. So... Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, I mean, they, the fact that, that they didn't, you know, they, because they were talking to other engineers about their technology and their point of pride was that they were able to wrestle their particular technology into a commercial, you know, commercially viable product, you know, but they didn't appreciate where the, where the compelling benefit was from at a high level from the customer and from the investor's point of view. So, so make they sure to articulate what the what the value would be and then translate that on what kind of numbers are we going to come out of it. Okay, these are the numbers. Then it starts to be enchanting, right? Right. It sounds obvious, right? It sounds obvious, but what we see is frequently we get, you know, entrepreneurs, they think they can cobble together, you know, a bunch of nice benefits, right? Well, we can do this, we can do this, and we can do this, and we can do this, and this. They think that cobble together a bunch of nice benefits makes a big benefit but generally it doesn't you know what we've seen over the years is that you know most successful companies and you know I, I'd be I'd love to sort of have a, a you know any any feedback on this but over the years most successful companies are successful because they do one thing amazingly well and then they do the rest well enough. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's, and so one thing extraordinary and then that, that's OK with the rest of it. Right. You're right. And, and that's focus, isn't it? Right. Right. That's right. Focus. I mean, that's that's what gets people's attention is the one thing amazingly well. If you think about SpaceX. Right. I mean, there are lots of rocket launch companies out there. Right. Um but they are the first ones, and I think, yeah, they're the first ones. Uh, uh, Blue Origin, I'm, you know, Bezos is getting close, but that can return the rocket intact, right? <laughs> and that was, you know, that is mind-boggling in terms of changing the game, totally changing the game. So, um, you know, that's the, um, and then, you know, what that game change enables them to do is launch thousands of these low earth orbit satellites to create a global internet connection um you know network that enables you to tap into the internet you know at a very reasonable cost um anywhere on the planet and that's starlink that's the whole starlink thing that they're building out uh so uh it's it's so you know after you after you get that one amazing thing, then you can go on to a few other amazing things. Um, but, you know, SpaceX, I'm not sure what the math is right now, but, you know, some significant percentage, I think something close to a third of all the satellites circling the Earth were put there by SpaceX. I mean, it's an incredible number. 
Um, somebody can check me on that, but it's at, you know at least twenty percent, maybe thirty, maybe maybe more. But and um, you know that's that's an extraordinary achievement as well. Yeah, but, no, he's an amazing guy. I mean, uh, the talk about uh, being able to go down through and and you know Tesla uh, Hyperloop. I mean, it's just incredible that somebody said talented. Uh, yeah. to go across multiple, multiple markets are seemingly unrelated and, and, you know, just move to the top on each one. But I suppose when you get to have the kind of money he does in the contacts, it's probably, uh, uh, <laughs> you got a lot of cheerleaders out there pushing yeah. you forward. You got an idea, a lot of smart people help you make it real. Now, I've got a, so a couple questions from the audience. We've got, um, Rebe says, how do you prove you're 10 times better to investors? Right. And that's, um, you know, and that's uh, one of my favorite wow pitches. I'll tell you my favorite wow. One of my favorite wow pitches. I got a few I can share. Um, it, you know, it's exactly that point. So I'm at a, I'm at a, I'm at a conference or whatever and um, chatting with a bunch of entrepreneurs. And this entrepreneur walks up to me and says, Bill, what would you say if I told you? that we can accelerate big data analytics by a factor of 100X with our software without changing your hardware. And I, you know, you know, 100X, 100X. Mm -hmm. And I blurted out um, and, you know, sometimes my wife says, Bill, you should think before you talk sometimes. But <laughs> so I, I, I blurted out, I blurted out the first thing that came to my brain. And um, and I said, I think that you're lying to me. <laughs> and so what you know what occurred what you know the, obviously she was not telling me something that was core that was, and she looked she didn't flinch she did not flinch. Um, when I said I'd say you're lying to me, she said, What if I told you we proved it last summer, in a pilot with Major League Baseball? And I said then I said then I would say. I want you in my office tomorrow if you can make it. <laughs> and so it was, it was, so the point of the story, aside from, you know, the fastest invite, you know, in my career, um, you know, to a partner pitch. Um, but the point of the story is, is many, many, many entrepreneurs make extraordinary claims, um, you know, that, that they have some compelling value proposition and the, you know what you need to bring to the table is evidence that what you are saying is true because unfortunately in our experience entrepreneurs have a tendency to exaggerate right <laughs> and um you know, so you know as uh, a, yeah so many 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 years ago we we when we when we Underage Technology Ventures, and we started listening to pitches, and um, I, you know, we realized that entrepreneurs just consistently, consistently would exaggerate all these different aspects of their pitch, and so we developed um, what is called the top ten entrepreneur lies, and so if you go on, <laughs> so if you go on the internet and you type in, you know, top 10 entrepreneur lies Reichert. Um, you'll get one of my versions. You can also top, you can also type type in top 10 entrepreneur lies Kawasaki, and you'll get uh, you know guy's version, but um, which are pretty similar. The um the uh, but the point being that VCs know that entrepreneurs exaggerate. And so it's not good enough to it's not good enough to claim a compelling value proposition. You've got to justify or validate it somehow. There's got to be some evidence that what you are saying is true. And so, you know, and that gets to then the summary of the whole book. So I'll save you guys all $9.95. I know that's a stretch for you, but I'll save you all <laughs> and tell you the, you know, the summary of the whole book is in your pitch. The, the most important thing is what I call the three C's. You have to be clear. You have to be clear about what it is you're doing. And that's a whole separate topic in terms of how many entrepreneurs are not clear, right? You have to be clear what you're doing. 
Second C, you have to be compelling. This is my compelling value proposition 10X, right? And then the third C is you have to be credible. You've, you know, we've got to believe what you're saying. So be clear, be compelling, be credible. And, and those, you know, th those aspects of any communication apply to everything you do as an entrepreneur. Every communication, think about it, you know, whether it's to a VC or whether it's to a customer or whether it's to a potential employee or a partner or a journalist, right? I mean, you got to be clear, you got to be compelling and you got to be credible. So look at your website today. Look at your website today. If I go, you know, every entrepreneur here, go to your website, look at what's in the, you know, what's above the fold, as they say, right? What do you see? Um, well, the first time, the first time anybody goes to your website, what do they see? Is it clear what you do? You know, most websites, you look at the page and it says, we empower the future of education. Yay. <laughs> I mean, it's so good. Um, but, um, or something, right? You know, um, so you know, is it clear what you do? Um, yeah, empowering the future of education is not clear enough. Okay, that's the, to make that point clear. <laughs> you know, is it compelling? I, you know, I, we empower the future of education. I'm, I don't believe you, right? And is it credible? Of course not, right? Um, so, in all of your communications, you've got to be clear, you've got to be compelling, and you've got to be credible. Now, maybe the credible piece you can't fit above the fold, but. Um, uh, but boy, the clear and compelling have got to be the first thing that we see or hear. And so one of the other main points of getting to wow is you have to get to wow in the first 20 seconds. So you you don't have, <laughs> you don't end with your wow, right? It's not about, you know, ending with a bang. You've got to start with your wow. You know, otherwise, you know, we're checking our mail, right? <laughs> and so you've got to start with your wow. And what I'm saying is you've got 20 seconds to get to wow. You know, otherwise, you might as well go home. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, the other thing that entrepreneurs don't appreciate is that 98%, if not 99%, of all of their pitches are going to be less than 30 seconds. And, you know, entrepreneurs look at me and say, wait a second, Bill, no, I mean, I've never been to an elevator pitch competition that's less than a minute, right? Mm -hmm. Well, gang, gang, forget it. Elevator pitches are virtually irrelevant in the real world. When do you ever use an elevator pitch competition? I mean, when do you ever use an elevator pitch? The only, the only time, the only time I've ever heard an entrepreneur use an elevator pitch is at an elevator pitch competition, right? You don't use it in the real world. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's, you know, so elevator pitch competitions are an okay venue to exercise your, you know, your pitching talent, but, but it's not a real world. You know, most of your pitches are less than 30 seconds. It's, you know, the first time you meet someone, it's, you know, how you introduce, how you introduce yourself on Zoom. Um, mm -hmm. it's, you know, you're at a trade show at a trade show, you know, 99% of the people you talk to are not going to listen to you for more than 30 seconds. Right. Um, so, so most of your pitches are less than 30 seconds. You better figure out how to be clear, compelling, and credible in, you know, 20 seconds. No, I, I love it. And, you know, the other thing, like you, you said that statement with the a hundred times, uh, um, the wow statement, right. having those few words to get people's attention because the thing is you want to get to the next level is really important. And if you can back it up. So the point is for all of you out there, it's not to just have that wow statement. It's having the backup to make sure it's not exaggerated. So those kind of, we used to, one of the companies that um, I was involved with, we said, um, you can't control the weather, but you can't control the impact on your business. And when we did that, people would open it up and they would say, well, tell me more about it. And so what your, your job is to go out and get people to ask more questions. So you get people like Bill that have a $2 billion fund. They're really interested in looking for very cool companies, but let's come up with a great wow statement and then back it up with the facts. So don't exaggerate it. 
don't come up with something that's not right or true. Make sure it's backed up. And if you do, you get people like Bill, they're going to listen to you. So, Bill, we're coming up. We're, we're, I love conversations with you because we're, like, uh, we're about 20 minutes over, but it's perfect. Um, the, the, you know, and maybe we can have another one. It's, uh, it's fascinating. By the way, we get a lot of very, very positive feedback from me with you. We're posting them all over through um, um, our venues, channels. But anyhow, in summary, for the, the startups that are out there today, the current condition of market, it's so um, any advice for them right now and, and yeah. what they need to focus on? Yeah. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, again, I'm, first thing, first thing is, you know, current condition of the market. I don't know. I mean, everybody seems to think the sky is falling. The sky's not falling. I mean, we're, we're, you know, busier than ever. The, the, it's not that deals aren't getting done. I mean, I think there is, there is, a lot of the fluff at the edges has been scraped away. So that's fair. Um, and so, I, but, you know, nobody on this call is fluff at the edges, right? Okay. <laughs> Everybody on this call. Not so, that we know of. <laughs> so, you know, so the fluff at the edges is getting scraped away. And then the other thing that's happening is that the, you know, irrational exuberance in terms of over overfunding these insane, you know, unicorns, um, you know, the overfunding is getting scraped away. And so the statistics look, you know, disastrous, right? Um, oh, my God, right? The, you know, the sky is falling. No, no, the core the core is is unbelievably healthy right now, um, and so it's a little bit harder. You know, it's a little bit harder, and you have to make sure that your words match sort of this this sort of adjusted reality of you know it's not about uh, burning cash and gaining market share, you know, and not worrying about ever having a path to profitability. Um, it's about, you know, building a, a validated, sustainable, high growth, high, com, you know, compelling value proposition company. And there's, un, you know, unbelievable appetite out there for those companies. And so, you know, you've got to get some validation so that we know you're not part of the fluff. Once you get the validation, then you've got to use your network, you know, any angels or the accelerator you're with or customers, initial customers, you've got to use your network to get an introductions to, you know, to good investors who will listen to your wow. But again, um, you know, it's not that hard. It, well, it depends on where you are in the world. That's fair. That's fair. But it's, it's, it depends a little bit on where you are in the world. But one of the great things about COVID, I know it's hard to say that, but one of the great things about COVID is that it really has flattened the global venture ecosystem. And now we don't really pay that much attention to where you are. I mean, we pay attention to the story, you know, in terms of, of what you're doing. Um, and then, you know, we dig in and we discover, oh, my God, they're in Israel or, you know, oh, my God, they're in Montreal or, you know, oh, my God, you know, they're in Miami, right? <laughs> but, um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it is much less so about where you are and your local venture ecosystem than it used to be. But it's still, you know, you still have to get some initial credibility, and you still have to figure out what your wow is. You've still got to figure out how to get investors to fall in love. But that puts you, you know, that puts you in the in the top five percentile, if you can nail those elements. And then it's just the hard work of getting the connections, and you know, getting the opportunity to pitch. So yeah, no, you know, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah. So for all the audience out there, you know, Bill, thanks for taking time one more. I'd like to do another one with you because every time we come up, there's so much yeah. more and yeah. we appreciate it. 
But um, my name's Gary Fowler, and I'm the host of How to Build a Unicorn. You can check us out in GSD Venture Studios, gsdbs.com. We have GSD Presents uh, twice a week. We have uh, incredible guests coming in, everybody from Nobel Prize um, folks to uh, actors from actresses from Hollywood who have built companies. The key is, how do we make this a better planet? How do we grow business? How do we democratize opportunity? And uh, how do we create sustainable opportunities for us all? Thanks, Bill. Thanks to my audience. Thanks for joining today. Stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. My name is Gary Fowler. I'm your host. Check out GSD Venture Studios, gsdvs.com. Check out Pegasus. What's the best way to get all of you, Bill? Ah, um, yeah, let's see. Let me just type my, um, uh, into the, in, you know, into, whoops, are you there? Um, into yep. the chat room. Uh, Bill at PegasusVentures.com. Um, no, I just sent it to Lance. I'm sorry. I didn't. Oh, well, but it's Bill at, sorry. Well, Lance has it now. Um, it's <laughs> Bill at PegasusVentures.com. So Gary, would you also do me a favor? Would you save the chat and um, would you save the chat and uh, and uh, and send it to me? I'm you know I didn't have a chance to look at. There's a ton of stuff in the chat, um, and I'll be interested to see what's in there. Um, if you would save it and forward, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, I'll go down through. I got to figure out how to save it, but uh, um, okay. I, it I hope I hope you have people who know I've how recorded, to. I've recorded it, but I didn't. I didn't do that. We'll go down through and figure it out. Anyhow, okay. thanks, so, thanks so much for taking All right, the time. Thanks, okay, and, take care. Uh, take care, everybody. Talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye.